He's ruled for 30 years, but he's facing unprecedented street protests. Public anger is growing in Sudan over rising food prices. So, will President Omar al-Bashir survive? What does he have to offer? And this is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. Sudan lost most of its oil reserves when the South seceded in 2011, and it has struggled to recover. Inflation rates have skyrocketed. Prices have more than doubled, and the value of the Sudanese pound, it's plunged. Protests against the worsening situation started on Wednesday in the eastern region, quickly spreading across the country into the capital Khartoum. The government of Omar al-Bashir reacted to demands at resign by imposing curfews and a state of emergency. Hiba Morgan has more from Khartoum. It's day four of protests in Sudan, and today people have come out in the southern state of South Kordofan. They've burned down the, the ruling uh, party's uh, headquarters, the National Congress Party's headquarters have been burned down to the ground, and people are once again protesting the same thing. They're protesting the economic crisis. They're protesting the fact that there is no bread in bakeries and that the government is trying to increase the price of bread when it, there is no bread to begin with. They're also protesting the fact that they, are, they have to wait in line at, and, and at queue up at ATMs and banks to be able to access their own money. And that they have to queue up at fuel stations to access fuel. Now, Sudan's economic uh, situation has been deteriorating rather quickly over the past few months. In January, the dollar was one one dollar to thirty pounds. But this, but today, this morning, it's nearly sixty Sudanese. It's, it's nearly sixty Sudanese pound to a dollar. And for many people, that is very, very unaffordable. Uh, it makes market prices go higher and and make it makes it very hard for them to be able to feed their own families despite the income that they earn. Now, Sudan's inflation right now is at 70 percent, and, and the government is saying that they're going to try to elevate, um, they, they're going to try to ease for people, they're going to try to make things easier for people, and, and try to make sure that they have what they need so that they don't go out and protest. And they have also told the security forces not to use brutal, excessive force. And nine people have been killed so far, and dozens have been injured. But the Minister of Information this morning also said that they are not going to tolerate people vandalizing things on the street, that they're not going to tolerate houses, cars, and, and, and shops being burned down to the ground. And it's, it's quite concerning and, um, and to many rights groups, such as Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, which have issued press statements saying that the government should not use excessive force to respond to these uh, protesters. Now, the protesters are, are very clear in their demands. They want the government to go. They want new economic reforms. They want new economic policies that would simply make it easy for them to be able to afford daily goods and go on with their lives. Hiba Morgan for Inside Story. So who is Omar al-Bashir? He came to power in a military coup in 1989 and has ruled Sudan with an iron fist since then. He's been re-elected president several times, most recently in 2015, when most opposition parties boycotted the vote. This government signed a peace deal to end the 21-year civil war between North and South in 2005 and he oversaw the secession of South Sudan into an independent state in 2011. Al-Bashir faces two international arrest warrants and a travel ban on charges of genocide and war crimes in the Darfur region. Despite this, he's made several diplomatic visits and was the first Arab leader to visit Syria since the war began there. Let's bring in our guest now from Khartoum, Faisal Mohamed Saleh, a political analyst and a former director of programs at Tiba Press here in Doha, Abdel Wahab Elefandi, professor of politics at the Doha Institute. And in Oxford in the UK, Douglas Johnson, author of the book South Sudan, A New History for a New Nation. Welcome to the program, all of you. Um, Faisal, I want to um, start with you. Um, the focal point of these protests has been Adbara. Why, was, why there and, and why was this the breaking point? Well, there is no explanation, but maybe the history. Abra has been uh, has a very long history during the colonizations, national struggle history. Uh, Abra was the, the capital of the Sudan Railway. Uh, headquarters was in Abra. It's a, a, a city of workers, and the workers have a very long history of being uh, part of the national movement and of the trade union movement, which started from Adbara. And I think Adbara uh, preserved this history and was part of, of all struggles, either during the colonization or even the national government when we had uh, uh, dictators or military uh, 
governments. So that's, I think, part of the history. Of course, the direct reason was the rise of the food price, especially the bread. But that was all over the country. But the start came from Adbara. Okay. Um, Adel Wahab, well, let's talk about that. Yes, it seems that the tipping point was the rise in bread prices. But um, talk us through what got us to this point. Uh, first, uh, greetings to Faisal and Douglas. And uh, I think they, uh, I, I know this area because I am from Berber next door to Adbara, which also was the start of this, uh, uh, these demonstrations. And for, for a while, I think people have been really reaching a, a tipping point in the sense that uh, the, uh, the, not only the prices, but the, the legitimacy of the government itself and the way it has been uh, dealing with the problems, the insensitivity it has been showing to the, uh, to the feelings and the people. And uh, uh, it has been sometimes provocative in its, uh, in its uh, approach. I mean, only a couple of days ago, the president was saying that we have to lift up the prices of, uh, of uh, fuel. Uh, that's all a solution. And people were at, at the end of their tether. I mean, they don't, they can't even get their hands on the cash they have in the banks. And a lot of people, for example, when they go to hospital, this is also the government has done a lot for the health, uh, to destroy the health service. Uh, if you go to hospital, even in an emergency, you have to pay in advance uh, to the hospital. And uh, the people at the hospital would not accept, accept cash. So in an emergency? In an emergency, so you might have a dying child in the middle of the night when there's no banks uh, open and they will say you have to pay, for example, 10,000 pounds or we won't even look at your patient. So I think that this combination of, of, uh, uh, of lack of cash, uh, lack of uh, any people have low salaries, but when they put their money in the bank, they can't get it out. Yeah, they, 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 should, they expect to be able to go get their money. Yes, they, they expect you to come up with cash, but where, where can I get cash in the middle of the night uh, if, if I have an emergency? So I think this is, this is only one level of insensitivity the government has been showing. They just are not listening to the people. So this is something more than uh, only bread or, or, or just uh, fuel and cash, but the people have seen, see that this government is completely incompetent, completely insensitive, completely does not feel it's part of the country or the people. Okay, Douglas, let me bring you into this. When, when you listen to the conditions that Abdel Wahab is describing um, and, and you see the protests, were, there, were some sort of protests almost inevitable? Well, I think one of the uh, things that is new here is that the protests have been right across the country, uh, not just in the three towns uh, of the capital. Um, and one of the things that has also emerged from the protest is, is that in addition to mismanaging the economy, uh, in addition to a highly corrupt system of government, uh, you have an extremely repressive government. You have a national, uh, the, the national intelligence and state security uh, will arrest, detain and torture uh, dissidents. You will have the police going around uh, shaving people's heads off, uh, hair off, because they uh, disagree. They're supposed to be uh, un-Islamic afros that people wear, are supposed to be a, a, a voice of dissent or a symbol of dissent. Um, people are arrested for brewing alcohol and, and killed in detention. Uh, all of these things are, are bubbling up in addition to the fact that there are still wars being fought in the Blue Nile, the Nuba Mountains, and Darfur. And uh, the government is spending money on the military and those wars rather than fixing the economy or the infrastructure of the country. So, okay, all right. I mean, you laid out quite a list there. Faisal, the president, Omar al-Bashir. Um, it seems that a lot of these problems are of his making. Is he actually the person to fix any of it? I don't think so. They don't have a vision. They don't have a plan. And actually, as Dr. Alafandi said, they are insensitive to the, the problem that people are facing, as if they are not living with the people in the same country. Uh, the president actually behaves as if there is no problem, that he's very stable, uh, his party is uh, also stable in power, and that there are some problems that can be dealt with uh, after 2020 election, where he's 
now just looking to 2020. And I think he's maneuvering around. He's also uh, targeting 2020 election and using all the government power, all the government uh, resources, all the government organs just toward, towards that uh, uh, goal of reaching 2020 uh, election. And when he appoints the new prime minister, the, new, the prime minister promised that he's going to solve the economic uh, crisis. But it appears that also they don't have any plan, simply because it is actually a political crisis more than an economic crisis. You cannot solve the economic crisis without going back to the political crisis, uh, looking to uh, political reforms. As uh, Mr. Johnson said, we have war in three areas in Sudan. We have corruption. And that, that, that is a, a, a political problem need to be dealt with before you are going to face the economic crisis. And I think the government is insensitive to that. The president himself, as I said, whenever he's on TV or speaking to people in uh, any event, as if he's not feeling what the people is feeling. So Faisal, you say that he's been insensitive. You all say he's been insensitive to that, but has he? he's never really had his hand forced. He, he, he can be insensitive to it if he chooses to. Uh, that's that's probably his mistake is uh, that if you sometimes people can tolerate things some by people do uh, give you a chance for uh, for various reasons because they are afraid of what might happen but I think he has taken people he, yes he has taken people to a level where there's no hope uh, for a while for example people have been saying, if only if the American sanctions were lifted, uh, then things will improve. So the American sanctions were lifted last October, but things actually got completely and speedily okay, can, worse. Can I ask you about that, too? That's actually something I wanted to bring up, that, yes, the, the sanctions were lifted, but, but Sudan is still labeled um, a sponsor of terrorism. There's still so much baggage that comes with dealing with Sudan, even with the those sanctions being lifted, it seems that people still are afraid, investors are afraid to interact with Sudan. Well, I think the, 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 the thing is that uh, when the sanctions were lifted, especially the banking sanctions, uh, that actually uh, has led to the deterioration of the, uh, of the, of the currency value uh, very fast. And this might be actually uh, a, direct, uh, a direct consequence of that. But in any case, I think the government itself has been, uh, as I said in the article before, has been imposing sanctions on itself. Uh, for example, uh, travel, there's, uh, you, as a Sudanese person, you cannot travel freely in and out of the country. So a lot of, uh, of Sudanese expatriates don't want to go to Sudan because if you go there, it will take you very it's difficult to you to come out. So they could, for example, have cancel the exit visa for Sudanese, that would have improved things a lot. Uh, they, uh, the government is bureaucratic and corrupt at the same time. So investors uh, do not actually, uh, their problem is not the sanctions, but their problem is that the government itself, that if you are a, an investor, you come into the country, uh, first of all, there's so much bureaucratic hurdles that will uh, put you off. But even that, if you can uh, uh, succeed in in dealing with that, the official will say to you, you have to give me this, you have to give me part of 10% or, or so on and so on, or how okay. many. So people just get fed up. So the government itself, I think, is the cause. And the fact that the hopes have been, uh, have, uh, the hope has faded away. People have been saying, OK, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. But uh, the last meeting of the, of the ruling party, they came out with wanting to get the president re-elected for 2020, and the, the Constitution does not allow him to do that. Okay. So they want to amend the Constitution. And, and this is not the concern of the people. So the concern of the government seems to be totally different from what the people are concerned okay, about. Okay, Doug, let me bring you into this. Is there a possibility that the president could actually be overthrown? Like, where, where is his support coming from? The situation is uh, going to be very volatile because, as um, our Sudanese colleagues have uh, pointed out, people have now got no hope. 
Uh, when they have nothing to lose, uh, then they can, uh, oh, the, the situation can develop in all sorts of different ways. Uh, there are armed groups in uh, Sudan operating uh, without too much support from, uh, from around the country, but there could be a coalition of opposition that would uh, emerge now. Uh, the army is uh, not entirely behind the uh, government, and of course the, there are factions within the ruling party itself. Uh, there could be um, a, a coup that would uh, oust uh, Bashir. He, of course, is not the only problem. The problem is uh, rooted in the NCP and uh, in the structures of government. Uh, but there has been a long history uh, in Sudan of people being willing to turn to the army or to a faction of the army uh, to remove an incompetent or corrupt or oppressive government. Um, of course, uh, that hasn't always uh, resulted in an improvement, uh, but um, uh, there is uh, the opportunity when, if a government is overthrown and removed, there is the opportunity uh, for um, a, a new coalition of political interest uh, to try to set the country to, to right. Uh, the army isn't, uh, ha hasn't proved to be the best uh, arbiter of, of politics, as we've seen after all Bashir came in with a military coup. Sure. Uh, but there is that possibility. Whether it's likely or not, I really don't know. Faisal, I'd like your thoughts on that. Do you think that, that there really is a possibility that the government could be overthrown? Yes, I mean, there are many expected uh, scenarios, of course. The demonstration could go on, and then maybe this uh, 1964 and 1985 scenario repeated again, that the military intervene, not just as a military coup, to share power with civilians for uh, a short interim period. That happened again twice in the history, and, and it was only one year interim period, and then they have an election and they hand the power to uh, the, the civilian. But also a palace coup, one of the scenarios that is expected, that the interest group around the president could sacrifice the president to protect their own uh, interest, and they could try to portray that to the people as if this is a real change that they have toppled uh, uh, the president. And of course, also the total collapse of the country, uh, repeating the Libya, Yemen, and Somali scenario is also expected. The absent scenario, which you can be asked why is not here within this scenario, is that the government responds positively to the people's demands. And, and the government go for a real uh, political reform because there is no any signals, no indication uh, that the government will do that. There was many chance, some chance, uh, chances if the government want to do that. The national dialogue was one of them. Unfortunately, they were not serious of, of that. So, Abdel Wahab, would there ever, I mean, if the way Faisal decided it, laid it out, the government really isn't open to changing, but is there any possibility that for their survival, they would have to be open to the opposition in some way? Um, Sadiq uh, Ahmadi, opposition figure, he is back in Sudan. Is there any chance of that ever happening? I think that uh, I, for me, this, the government has already fallen from what I look at at the moment. There has never been, even in October uh, 64 and 85, there hasn't been this level of, of uprising. I mean, uh, during October, it's only a week, and there was a demonstration in Khartoum, as Douglas rightly said, a few in the, in the outside, but they were not the pressure. Now we have people really in revolt. Uh, and so what the government is doing now at the moment to survive is to shoot at people. Uh, so more victims and this more anger in the people. Uh, this is, if this continues, then we are, we are facing a very dark scenario. Already in this revolt, there is a hint of populism. The, uh, uh, the voices from mainly from young people, angry, sometimes from the periphery, all of them do not, do not have trust, not only in the government, but also in the opposition. There are more uh, tweets and, and Facebook attacks on Sadiq al-Mahdi and, and the other opposition leaders than the government, or not, if not uh, equal. So uh, we are, uh, the people now, there is not one revolt, there are tens of revolts, very similar to the Syrian scenario, where every town 
mm -hmm. has its own uprising. So I think what worries, what worries me is that if the army doesn't move quickly enough to remove al-Bashir, I don't think anybody now will trust al-Bashir with any reforms. He has, given, he has his chances. He has been actually uh, obstructing all reform. And I think the only way for, for him to go now, uh, okay. as Faisal, uh, yes. Let me, let me bring Doug into this for, for just a moment, though. Um, Doug, what other countries could have some sort of influence in this? Well, uh, this is, this is uh, I think it's a mistake to think that external countries can have any real influence on what is a very serious uh, internal problem. It's a matter of, of in fact, several serious internal crises uh, that have not been resolved. Uh, I think that uh, many of Sudan's neighbors are going to be very nervous about what is happening. Um, right now, uh, the Western countries like the UK and the United States uh, have very different interests in the UK. Well, first of all, the UK government can do nothing while it's embroiled in this Brexit debate. And the only interest they seem to have in Sudan is to stop uh, migrants coming to Europe. And in that case, they seem to be quite willing for a repressive government in Khartoum to be in power. The United States, well, we don't know what the, that the U.S. has any policy. It could be changed by a telephone call between President Trump and his friend Mohammed bin Salman. Um, uh, uh, so I don't think you can look to external um, intervention or external influence to bring anything to uh, an end. One of the problems with the U.S. proposing to lift sanctions uh, on Khartoum is that there has been an insistence on an improvement of the human rights situation and then a particular in, uh, insistence on the improvement of religious freedom. This isn't happening. So uh, uh, certainly there are voices in Congress that will prevent the United States from really uh, uh, trying to throw a lifeline to, to Bashir. Okay. But whether there will be anything coming out of the U.S. that would have a, a positive impact on the internal politics of Sudan. I doubt that very much at this point. Faisal, what do you see is happening next in Sudan? Uh, again, as I said, all the scenarios are expected and uh, it depends on if the protests continue. And I think... Do you think uh, they will? I expect uh, army intervene. I think, I mean, today, of course, because it is not a working day in Sudan, it's not like yesterday, it's not like the day before. Uh, new cities, actually, uh, there is a, a demonstration in new cities in Rahad, in North Kurdufan, uh, again in Madani, uh, in Adbara, it's again. Khartoum is a bit calm comparing with, uh, with yesterday, but it's expected to be in the nights. And I think all scenarios are expected. All scenarios are expected. The only unexpected scenario is a positive response from the government, as I, again, as I said, to the people demand, unfortunately. Abdel Wahab, how do you see this playing out? Do you think that these protests will continue and perhaps even escalate? Uh, I, I think it looks like it. Uh, the government is trying probably to play the card of the fact that the violence is, uh, is involved in this, uh, especially uh, burning and looting of properties. Uh, this might scare the middle classes of Khartoum uh, a bit. Uh, they are already not very e uneasy with this. The fact, as I said, that the, uh, the people who are leading the revolution and mainly useful radicals who do not have trust in, in the elite as a whole might play a part. But I, I think the anger now, uh, which we've seen, in, is unprecedented and unless something radical and drastic is done by the government, like sidelining al-Bashir and uh, uh, getting a national unity government, for example. Uh, the army is most likely, as we have uh, seen, as Douglas Wright said, the army has not been 100% behind the government in this. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so uh, one of the scenarios is that the army would do what, what has been done in Egypt okay. and get rid of the president. And then we see how it goes from there. All right. It is certainly a volatile situation, and we appreciate you uh, weighing in on this, um, all of you. Um, Faisal Mohamed Salah, Abdel Wahab Al-Afandi, and Douglas Johnson. Thank you, gentlemen.
and thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you visit our website, aljazeera.com. You can also join the discussion on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Rochelle Carey and the entire team. Bye for now.